Seven shots rang out, half a million dollars in cash, and the love triangle that ended in a brutal murder. A web of lies, jealousy, and deceit, leaving one victim, 34-year-old July Johnson. What happens when love turns fatal? This is the Fatal Attraction Podcast with a wicked rival, July Johnson. She was the woman everyone wanted. She was beautiful, gorgeous. She was special in so many ways. She was like the apple of everybody's eye. But she only had eyes for him. She liked the way he looked. He's a very charismatic man. They were the perfect couple to me. Until the day their relationship ended in a hail of bullets. My girlfriend She had no chance. I heard pop, 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 pop. It just blew my mind. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, no, nah, she's not dead. No way somebody could want to hurt her like that. And now it's up to detectives to determine, was it over her boyfriend's secret life? He wasn't forthcoming about where the money came from. Was it the ex who couldn't let go? I want a lawyer. Maybe he is still missing. Or would her killer never be found? People started thinking maybe somebody just got away with murder. Hold it right there, Brown! January 13th, 2017. It's Friday the 13th in Warren, Michigan, a busy suburb just north of Detroit. The city of Warren lies in Macomb County and that's the third largest city in the state of Michigan. It's a great blue collar city, the heart of the auto industry, General Motors Tech Center. It was the start of the busy time of the day for businesses in Warren to start. But that morning, Just as the rush hour begins and the first engineers and designers are pulling into work at the tech center, gunshots ring out in an upscale neighborhood nearby. It was between 7 and 7.30 when the initial uh, 911 call went out. 911. Hey, my girlfriend just got shot. The caller, 42-year-old Ron Fortner, tells the 911 dispatcher that he'd heard gunshots just moments after his girlfriend, July Johnson, stepped out the door that morning. Where is she at? Outside, just running in the house. She was going out to her car, going to work that morning, and someone came up, shot her several times. Who shot her? I don't know. She ain't breathing. She's not breathing. Where was she shot at? I don't know. I just see blood. Police and EMTs race to the scene. It's a very quiet area. Very few radio runs for any type of uh, incidents, especially uh, a shooting. When first responders arrive, they find July on the ground outside the house, her boyfriend at her side. As we approached EMS and firefighters were on scene, uh, rendering aid to the victim. Despite the multiple gunshot wounds, July is still clinging to life. They took her to the closest hospital with uh, hopes they could revive her. 34-year-old July Johnson was always full of life. She was gregarious, loved being around people, being social, and just had a great energy. She was just like an uh, overall genuine person, one of the best people that I've ever met. She was, like, beautiful inside and out. (laughs) July never had any shortage of men vying for her attention, either. She was always kind of discreet with her relationships, in a way. She had a series of boyfriends in her 20s, but she never really settled down. But there was one constant in July's life, her teenage daughter. She was crazy about her daughter. They just had a really good relationship, and it was just beautiful. She was a great mother, and they were extremely close. July had a good job in customer service. 
She liked jobs that involved communication and interacting with other people. She was great at those kind of things. She was talking about buying a house. She was pretty satisfied where she was working, you know, and those were her goals. But she also felt that there was something missing. She always talked about falling in love and getting married. And one day, she found the man she hoped might be the one. She said she literally just saw him in passing. She liked the way he looked. <laughs> she liked his hair. The man who turned July's head was 42-year-old Ron Fortner. From that point on, they were like glue. He was cool, he was funny, and she just was attracted to him naturally. He's a very charismatic man. You know, he's well-spoken, he's articulate, uh, he's well-dressed. He was also a successful businessman, the owner of a Detroit car wash. He's washed my car a few times, him and his crew, you know, and then I go to pay, he's like, uh-uh, it's on the house. By the end of 2016, July and Ron had been together for over two years. July had her own place, and she made sure she always had a place for her and her daughter. But they spent a lot of time together. I know she loved him to death. As far as we knew, they was, like, happy, and it was cool. In fact, July's friends wondered if the relationship would end in marriage. She was ready to settle down. She loved him so much. And on New Year's Eve 2016, when the couple jetted off to Vegas, friends wondered if that day had finally come. They took a lot of photos together. Uh, they seemed happy. But they didn't get married. I think that she wanted to see a future, but she wasn't sure if he was ready for what she was ready for. And now, less than two weeks after returning from Vegas, EMTs are fighting to save July's life. They were performing CPR, which in a shooting scene is not always a, uh, a good sign. She was transported to the hospital. As the ambulance races away, detectives pull July's boyfriend, Ron Fortner, aside for a quick statement. Uh, so you saw the shooter? I think so, yeah. yeah. The boyfriend had saw somebody running away, you know, with a hooded type jacket on in the eastern direction, you know, around the house. And that's about all we had at that moment. With so little to go on, detectives weren't sure if Ron's statement was a possible lead or a lie. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm standing here talking to the person that actually shot July. More secrets are revealed once we return with more Fatal Attraction. At the beginning of 2017, it looked as if single mom July Johnson had found lasting happiness with her boyfriend, Ron Fortner. They were always good together, always a good time. He was always very generous. They were just naturally attracted to each other. And as far as I knew, they was happy. But as she left for work on the morning of January 13th, Someone shot July multiple times outside of Ron's suburban Detroit home. The boyfriend had called in on 911. He's the lead suspect, potentially, because he's the boyfriend. He's on scene. Maybe he's telling the truth, maybe he's not. He advised us that he saw the perpetrator running from the location behind another set of condos. Canvassing the neighborhood, detectives locate a witness who appears to confirm Fortner's story. She's pretty sure she saw somebody running from the car where Johnson was shot. According to the witness, the man in the hoodie ran towards the park. That surrounds the development. Walkways went through the wetland area that connected into a shopping center. Acting on the tip, officers span out along the footpaths, hoping to locate the suspect. They were searching both for the suspect and anything the suspect may have dropped. Police don't find the shooter, but they don't come up empty-handed. They found a pair of gloves that they seized as evidence. 
If the shooter dropped them, their DNA could be inside of the gloves. A search of the crime scene also allows detectives to tentatively reconstruct how the shooting occurred. She was approaching her car when she was shot, so she was right next to the passenger side of her car. There was a couple of the gunshot bullet holes in the vehicle. You could see several shell casings. They were all from a 9 millimeter. Based on the number of casings, the shooter fired seven shots, and most of them found their mark. Probably saw uh, four to five gunshot wounds to the victim. But why would someone brutally gun down a hardworking single mother? Hoping for some more concrete answers, detectives turned back to July's boyfriend, Ron. Detectives interviewed him at the scene in the back of a police cruiser. We didn't want him to go back into the home, his own home, which was potentially part of the crime scene. He was visibly upset. I would describe him as in shock to what had happened, clearly concerned for July. Asked several times if we had any updated information. Please tell me, is she alive, man? I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. Ron tells the detectives that it had started out as a typical Friday morning. What was she doing outside? She getting ready to go to work. She was just walking to her car, you know, just going about her regular day. But this was no regular day. I heard her say, oh, God, I heard pop, 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 pop. Ron says that he ran outside when he heard the shots and caught a glimpse of someone running down the street. Oh, was he white or black? I don't know. They didn't see the person's face wasn't able to see any distinguishing features or anything that would help us in the investigation. The rest of Fortner's answers weren't very helpful either. Do you have problems with anyone? No. No? No. I asked him several times, you know, who would have done this? And he kept saying, I don't know, I don't know. But if that's true, Detectives will soon have some bad news for July's boyfriend. Not long after they questioned Ron in the back of the police cruiser, detectives received word from the hospital that July was dead. When we finally notified him that she had passed away, he cried, became emotional. He reacted like anybody else who just was told that they lost a loved one. In terms of the emotional reaction, the officers got their gut feeling based on their experience that he really didn't have anything to do with it. However, they still needed to rule him out as a suspect. We want to eliminate him as quickly as possible if he's not involved so we can start looking at other avenues of why this may occur. Detective's first step is to search Fortner's condo. He volunteered to let us freely come in the condo, so he was very cooperative with us. But the search will soon reveal that July's boyfriend does have something to hide. Who has half a million dollars just sitting in their condo? We also found approximately 20 cell phones, which was also very unusual. Clearly, there was a lot more to the story that he wasn't telling us. More secrets are revealed once we return with more Fatal Attraction. You're out here hustling, but you're also using the McDonald's app to have your favorites delivered to your door. That's hustling smarter. Order McDelivery in the McDonald's app. I participate in McDonald's. While detectives in Warren, Michigan, search Ron Fortner's condo, word of his girlfriend July Johnson's murder spreads like wildfire. Her daughter's grandmother had called me. She said she gone, Rolanda, and she just started crying. And that was it. Everything else is uh, just a blur. I couldn't believe it. The impact, on um, like, it just, it just knocked me off my feet. I'm like, it's no way somebody could want to, like, want to hurt her like that. However, back at the crime scene, detectives are starting to wonder if it's no coincidence July was killed outside her boyfriend's condo. There was a large amount of money that was removed from the house. It was well over half a million dollars in cash. 
Cash was located throughout the house in different locations. We found $30,000 in a closet. There was money in the garage, about $540,000 total. Detectives also find almost two dozen burner phones inside the house. The stacks of cash and burner phones certainly suggested that Fortner was up to something. And when the search moves outside to his truck, detectives become even more suspicious of July's boyfriend. The detectives went through that F-150 very closely, and they found a professionally built hidden compartment in the front seat passenger area where the airbag normally goes. Inside the hidden compartment, detectives find a handgun. It had serial numbers, stand it off. It was also a 9 millimeter, which was the same caliber as the murder weapon. Detectives send the gun to the lab for ballistics testing and then haul July's boyfriend down to the police station. Obviously, he's involved in a whole different world that the officers have to find out about. A quick search of the database before the interrogation confirms what detectives suspected about Fortner's world. He had convictions for high-level drug trafficking. He was a suspect in numerous narcotics investigations with other law enforcement agencies. He was also currently on probation for federal drug charges. But does his dealing have anything to do with July's murder? Detectives decide it's time to confront Ron with what they've learned. You've got to start being honest with us. Look, it's not what you think. All right. Well, tell us then. He did not request an attorney. He continued to talk to us. But he wouldn't talk about everything. There was a lot of things he wasn't forthcoming about. The narcotics trafficking, where the money came from, the weapon, and so forth. However, Ron insists he had nothing to do with July's death. I didn't shoot her. I loved her. Well, if you didn't shoot her, who did? At the scene, July's boyfriend claimed to have no idea about the shooter's identity. But this time, he gives detectives a name. And it's someone who didn't have a thing to do with his drug dealing. It said, who comes to mind that would be responsible for something like this? His response was, my wicked evil ex. Your wicked evil ex? Who's that? Marcy. Marcy Griffin. He believed that she was involved in the crime. According to Ron, he and Marcy had a long history together. He and Marcy Griffin had known each other for many years from their old neighborhood, so to speak. They kind of grew up together. They had uh, been dating for on and off again for 17 years. This has been up a while, but she's still around. They had children together. And because of the children, they stayed in each other's lives. And according to Ron, Marcy had never approved of his relationship with July. Marcy had been upset with uh, the relationship. She did not like the fact that this uh, new, younger, pretty woman had uh, uh, a role in the, the life of her children. Did that mean Marcy was angry enough to have her rival gunned down in the street? Ron appears convinced. It was quite a powerful quote. My wicked ex-girlfriend. Detectives had to wonder, was Ron pointing to his ex in order to deflect suspicion from himself? Until they find the answer, detectives keep Fortner in custody. Since they found a weapon in his possession, they were able to hold him on the parole violation. Then, Detectives turned to July's friends and family. We spoke to several people in her, involved in her life, her family, her friends. Most of July's friends tell detectives that they're well aware of what Ron Fortner does for a living. She's always dated dudes that are street dudes, you know what I mean? But had that ultimately cost July her life? Is there something from that lifestyle that might have brought this on? Like as far as retaliation against him? According to most of her friends, the answer was yes. 
My initial thought was it was something to do with him. Hold it right there, Frank! More secrets are revealed once we return with more Fatal Attraction. You're out here hustling, but you're also using the McDonald's app to have your favorites delivered to your door. That's hustling smarter. Order McDelivery in the McDonald's app. I participate in McDonald's. After 34-year-old July Johnson was gunned down on her way to work, detective suspicion first turns to her boyfriend, Ron Fortner, an ex-felon with a string of drug arrests. After finding half a million dollars of cash hidden in his house, detectives suspected he was still dealing, too. But Ron had pointed the finger at his ex-girlfriend, Marcy Griffin. His exact words were that she was wicked evil, and he was pretty convinced that she was involved. Before detectives look into Marcy, they book Ron for a probation violation. At this time, we're placing you under arrest. Is it possible Ron is telling the truth? Detectives look into his claims by questioning July's family and her closest friends. What we were trying to do is basically figure out, was it a situation of a domestic case gone bad? Was there more to the story in terms of other people involved? Or was it somehow connected to a high-level narcotics trafficking where one of his prior deals had gone bad? July's friends tell detectives they'd often worried about her safety. We've always been, you know, scared of this for this day to come because of the type of men that she's always dealt with. Was she attracted to a certain type of guy? Yeah, like straight guys who definitely had to have some money. Hang with those type of people. You, you pray every night you don't get this phone call. It was always a fear. July's friends weren't just scared of the other drug dealers, but also the women they ran with. She dealt with envy and jealousy her whole life because she was such a beautiful person. These girls, these women, really hated her. According to July's friends, one woman hated her more than most. Ron's ex, Marcy Griffin. She's been stalking July for over two years now. We had just heard so many stories about how ridiculous she could get. I guess she was going into her job threatening her. July's friends say that the threats had recently escalated too. Apparently, it started after posts about Ron and July's trip to Vegas appeared on social media. She thought they got married. She clearly, clearly had some rage and just jealousy. From what I heard, Marcy went up to the car wash or something and was like, you married that bitch. And I guess they got into it. And she said something to the effect of, um, you gonna feel this. Unsure if Marcy actually followed up on her threat, or if she was just a jealous ex venting, detectives head to her job for an interview. She worked in an office building in Detroit. Their human resource persons brought her to a conference room for us to talk with her. Have a seat. The interview ends almost as soon as it starts. She immediately refused to speak to officers. Does that mean Marcy has something to hide, though? All detectives know for certain is that she was nowhere near the crime scene when the murder occurred. From security footage from her place of employment, she was in downtown Detroit on Friday morning. However, to fully rule out her involvement, detectives also subpoenaed her cell phone records. Then detectives returned to the crime scene and revisit the nature trail behind the development where the shooter allegedly fled. Detectives were searching that Marcia area even more thoroughly to make sure that they didn't miss anything. Turns out they had missed something, a possible murder weapon hidden in the tall grass. It was a nine millimeter, it was tossed near the nature trail. It was probably located within 30 or 40 feet of where we located the gloves all but convinced that July's killer fled along the nature trail, 
the detectives canvassed the shopping center on the other side of the wetland. They went to each and every business in the area to collect as much closed circuit TV or security video as possible. Reviewing security video from outside a fitness center, detectives find what they're looking for. On the morning of the shooting, a video showed the SUV parked near the nature trail. At around 7 a.m., a man in a dark hoodie gets out of the passenger side door. The hoodie matched the description that both July's boyfriend and his neighbor gave the detectives. He walked towards where the murder scene was. About 30 minutes later, the man returns in a hurry. Right after the 911 calls came in for the shooting, we were able to see the same individual running to that suspect vehicle. He jumps into the SUV and it drives away. We were convinced that that was the suspect fleeing the scene. Although, based on the video, detectives now believe they're looking for two suspects. Both uh, exiting and getting back into the vehicle, he entered through the passenger side of the vehicle. So you knew there was another occupant of the vehicle at the person who was driving. But can the footage lead detectives to either suspect's identity? The quality of the surveillance video or the security video wasn't the best. We narrowed down what kind of vehicle it was. Unfortunately, detectives were unable to make out the vehicle's license plate. It was the first time I ever felt I may have a case that I'm not going to be able to solve. But then, just as the killer's trail is going cold, the crime lab makes a breakthrough. The firearm that we recovered was proven to be the one that fired the round that was recovered from the body of July Johnson. But the even bigger news was that the DNA from the gloves found nearby matched a sample that was already in the database. The DNA evidence gave us a name. More secrets are revealed once we return with more Fatal Attraction. One morning, you just walk in with a bag of everyone's faves from McDonald's, drop it on the counter, and say, uh, breakfast is on me. Boom! That's the power of saving money on the McDonald's app. Hope you can handle all that. Save money with the app. And participate in McDonald's must opt into rewards. Detectives in Warren, Michigan, have tentatively identified July Johnson's killer as 24-year-old Eric Gibson. The crime lab found Gibson's DNA inside gloves found near the murder scene. And he matched the description of that shadowy figure from the video. However, identifying Gibson as a suspect raises as many questions as it answers. How is Eric Gibson connected to July Johnson? Where did he come from? Who's he working for? Since July's boyfriend, Ron Fortner, was involved in drug trafficking, detectives suspected that a rival drug dealer may be behind the murder, or possibly Fortner himself. Fortner's ex-girlfriend, Marcy Griffin, is another possibility that detectives haven't ruled out. It was clear that Marcy Griffin truly did hate this woman and made threats to her. Hoping to determine who had hired Gibson, detectives try a direct approach. We knew approximately where Mr. Gibson lived, so we went down to the area and were able to locate Mr. Gibson. Are you Eric Gibson? When Detective Rushton interacted with him, Mr. Gibson assaulted him. Hold it right there, freeze, right now. Put your Don't hands move. Your back. But when detectives finally manage to bring their suspect in for questioning, the results are disappointing. Eric, your name came up in a homicide investigation. I don't know anything about that. However, detectives don't need him to talk to make an arrest. Eric Gibson was arrested for resisting and obstructing. He was held for that charge. Then, with Eric in custody, they comb through his phone records, looking for any clues as to who hired him. There's no connection from Eric Gibson to Marcy Griffin. Detectives fail to find any connection between Eric and July's boyfriend, Ron Fortner, either. But when they pull Eric's police record, something does pop up. 
a Michigan State trooper happened to pull over Eric Gibson in a vehicle uh, a night or two before the actual incident date. And he was driving an SUV that matched the one captured by a security camera, leaving the vicinity on the morning of the murder. The SUV doesn't belong to Gibson, though. Instead, the registration leads detectives to one of the most notorious figures in Detroit, George Ryder. His reputation does precede him in our city. Back to the 80s and the 90s, he was various parts of federal investigations, gun running investigations, and so forth. Ryder also served more than 10 years in prison on federal drug trafficking charges. Supposedly reformed, he's officially a music promoter and real estate developer. But detectives suspected that may be a front, just like the car wash that July's boyfriend ran. And Ryder has a family connection to Eric Gibson. George Ryder was an uncle of Eric Gibson, and that's how they knew each other. Gibson's link to Ryder leads detectives to suspect their initial assumption was correct, that Fortner's dealing, not Marcy's jealousy, led to July's murder. If Ryder was still involved in drug trafficking, there could have been some rivalry between the two men. We suspected she was just a person in the wrong place at the wrong time, maybe in the wrong relationship. Or could the secret behind July's murder still be out there? When detectives receive Marcy's phone records, they notice something curious. There was an exchange of text messages between this one number. It was the, the last text message on her records the night before the homicide, and it was the first text message in her records on the day of the homicide. But she never received another text from that number. Detectives are initially unable to determine who had been in contact with Marcy. It was a prepaid burner phone. However, they eventually come up with a way to trace it. Officers were able to ping it, locate where it was, and they went and seized it. Detectives traced the phone to a vehicle in Detroit. An investigative stop was made of that vehicle, and George Ryder was in the vehicle. After pulling him over, detectives question Ryder in the back of a police cruiser. This is part of a homicide investigation. Obviously, that's why we came the way we did, okay? Because, you know, we, we don't know who's involved and who may be armed and who may not be, okay? Ryder basically played dumb about the whole thing. Do you know a girl named Marcy? We're going to be at the end of No. You don't know Marcy Griffin? No. Detectives know he's lying. One of the phones you had on you has called Marcy Griffin hundreds of times. So I know you know her. Despite Ryder's lies, detectives don't take him into custody. I'm just going to catch you down one more time, and then you're going to be free to leave, okay? Detectives do take Ryder's phone, however, the burner he'd used to contact Marcy. Based on the court orders they had, they were able to seize that phone as evidence. Detectives also subpoena the records for Ryder's phone. This data turned out to be very important to our case. This data was how we tied George Ryder to Eric Gibson and showed their movements to and from the scene on the day of the shooting. We had them pinging together on the west side of Detroit the morning of the murder. A little before 7 that morning, both Ryder and Gibson's phones travel north to Warren. Based on this, detectives suspected it was Ryder who drove Gibson to the crime scene. And then, lo and behold, immediately prior to the murder, to the shooting, both phones were turned off and there was no activity. Ryder and Gibson's phones remained off for the next 30 minutes. And then those phones turned back on, traveling back to where they originated that morning. So we were able to establish a timeline of them being together. However, a timeline isn't all that the phone records establish. We located text message content between George Ryder and Marcy Griffin. On the morning of the homicide, George Ryder texted to Marcy Griffin, good morning, beautiful. 
We believe we now had a connection to the person that had a motive to want July murdered. More secrets are revealed once we return with more Fatal Attraction. Michigan detectives investigating the murder of July Johnson have linked the suspected shooter, Eric Gibson, to a renowned Detroit drug dealer named George Ryder. And Ryder's phone records revealed he was in regular contact with Marcy Griffin, who previously dated July's boyfriend, Ron Fortner. Through the text messages, we were able to pull out and piece together and figure out the storyline leading up to the murder. Reading the text messages between George and Marcy, it's clear detectives are dealing with more than just a simple murder for hire. They were sending uh, text messages to each other. I miss seeing you. I can't wait to see you again. Let's have dinner. There was obviously a romantic relationship. But for detectives, the most important texts are the ones George and Marcy exchanged on the day of the murder. Less than half an hour after someone, presumably Gibson, shot July multiple times, George texts Marcy, good morning, beautiful. And that wasn't all he said. What Mr. Ryder did is text Miss Griffin and say, it's a wonderful day, Friday the 13th. I hope you know what I mean. Detectives believed it was a code to let Marcy know that July was dead. It's the last piece of evidence the police need. We secured arrest warrants for George Ryder and Marcy Griffin. They were all charged with first-degree premeditated murder. July's family and friends welcomed the news. When I found out, I literally had to leave out of my office and go outside because I was so emotional. I just was like, thank God, because we were so heartbroken. We could never take away the pain. We could never take away the tragedy. But we were just trying to make sure that someone was held accountable. The reckoning comes in May of 2019, when Marcy, George Ryder, and Eric Gibson all go on trial together. It was basically three trials within one trial, because we had three actors and one murder. Eric Gibson was the hired gun. Eric had no other reason to kill July Johnson other than he was paid to do so. George Ryder was the middleman. George had no connection to July Johnson other than his relationship with Marcy Griffin. But prosecutors claim that it was Marcy Griffin who was the mastermind behind the murder. The prosecution basically said Marcy Griffin was insanely jealous and this is this was her way of getting revenge. The father of her children, a former boyfriend, was moving on with his life and fell in love with someone else. According to the prosecution, it was Ron and July's trip to Vegas that pushed Marcy over the edge. Marcy saw the post on social media and assumed that Ron and July had gotten married. It didn't happen, but Unfortunately, I don't think Miss Griffin ever found out that. Furious, Marcy had confronted Ron at his car wash. There was a cell phone video. In that video, Marcy wrote, I'm gonna get her, I'm gonna get you where it hurts. And on Friday, January 13th, 2017, Marcy finally got her revenge. George Ryder picked up Eric Gibson in the city of Detroit, they drove out to the location approximately 6.30 in the morning. Mr. Gibson exited the vehicle, walked over to the condo. He arrived just minutes before July left for work that morning. He approached her on foot, fired several shots, five of which struck her. After he shot July, Eric had sprinted back to where George waited in the rented SUV. Come on, we gotta let's go. go, let's go, let's go! Then, once their escape was made, George had sent his coded text to Marcy, informing her that July was dead. She orchestrated this entire thing and kind of had these two puppets working for her. 
and carrying out this absolutely heinous murder. When it's their turn, Marcy's attorney suggests that George Ryder was the real mastermind. The argument was that just because Miss Griffin didn't like July Johnson, that in, in no way meant that she had anything to do with the killing. According to theory, George orchestrated the whole thing without Marcy's knowledge, just because he knew she hated July. Will it be enough to sway the verdict? Even the detectives that put the case together are worried when it goes to the jury. We were always 100% confident that Eric Gibson was going to be found guilty of this murder. We were a little less confident with George and Marcy Griffin. But not the jury. All three defendants were convicted of first-degree premeditated murder. All three of them were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. For July's family and friends, the long wait for justice is finally over. I think it was like 875 days from the day that she was killed to that sentencing. That is a long time for a family to just be feeling so many emotions, anger, grief, frustration, shock. And even justice for July can't heal the pain of losing her. We waited so long for this day and she's still not here. So it doesn't give you relief. You feel good because somebody not totally getting away with something, but it don't really heal. Instead, all July's friends and family can do is cherish her memory. The best way to honor the dead is to live. So I try to live with her energy in mind. I try to be kind to people. She gave me inspiration, and I will forever be grateful to have her in my life. She was somebody that's just totally irreplaceable. A crime of love and war. July Johnson's family and friends are left in a state of distress following her murder. Detectives successfully solved the love triangle case of the murder of hardworking single mother July Johnson, answering questions and bringing closure to her loved ones. Coming up on the next episode of the Fatal Attraction Podcast. She was a hardworking single mom determined to make it. She was going to make sure she provided for those kids. She was staunchly independent. She didn't need a man. She had a great job and her own home. But on the verge of achieving all her dreams, she vanishes. She does not pick up her children that evening. This is not like her. I just knew this ain't right. Does this devoted mother have something to hide? A shocking murder resulting from a love triangle has left a small town in shambles and a community in mourning. What happened to 26-year-old mother Latoya Taylor? And what happens when love becomes fatal? Tune in to the next episode of the Fatal Attraction Podcast. We will see you in the next episode.